Good morning. I welcome you all to our Sunday service here at Ferndale United Methodist Church. To all those that brave the deep snow we're getting this morning. <laughs> and those that are sitting at home, we appreciate you viewing in and joining us this morning or later on today whenever you get around to joining us our service. We always appreciate your support and um, continue to do so. So um, today uh, we have a couple announcements. Well, one really main announcement is that Beth and Patty are really getting geared up to get going with this uh, food drive and with the clothes giveaway in the community. So they've been doing some research and they're meeting with a pastor from another church that has experience in this area. So we're going to get some ideas and get them together. But um, if anyone would be interested in joining that team to help them, they need people to help sort through everything and get things packaged up and ready to go out. So we're, we're gonna, they're going to be in the planning stages, and then um, they'll have some more information later. But just drop, just see either Patty or Beth and let them know that you're, you might be interested. So just pray on it, and um, thank you for considering, um, you know, s serving the needs of our community right here in Ferndale, which is what we're trying to do. Um, we, of course, again, we still, we're still doing our Bible study every Thursday night. I'll give that another plug because it really is a nice Bible study, and we, we always have a good time. And we just ask you, if you just get a hold of one of us, if you're even interested, and we'll you know, go over a little more detail with you. It's, it's pretty cut and dry and simple, and it's very comfort, comforting, and there's no stress level at all. You're just sitting in your home and relaxing, and we're all discussing or not discussing. You can just tune in. So um, we appreciate you to consider that also. Well, today, um, before we get going in worship, uh, we're going to be uh, getting into the scriptures today for, uh, from um, the message by Reverend Eugene Peterson. So Pastor Steve's got a message prepared from that, and he is from Christ Our King Presbyterian Church in Bel Air. I believe Pastor Steve said he's retired now, but that's basically where our, what our scripture readings are going to be from today, from, from his, um, his sermons. Um, also, uh, let us just get our hearts prepared for worship today as we um, we get into the message and um, let me give you a little synop synopsis of uh, what we're going to be doing today as far as our our uh, worship session is that Jonah is a prophet got to put my glasses on I cannot read this anymore <laughs> I need a stronger light above me Jonah is a prophet a man on the run from who from God after a series of wild adventures involving a seaport called Joppa, a huge boat and terrible storm, Jonah finds himself in the belly of a giant fish. But this isn't the end. It's here that God teaches Jonah how to receive grace and extend his mercy, even to his arch enemy. So today, it's not about the Bengal tigers or the rams. Today, we're going to be getting into the whales, right? Amen. <laughs> so if you'll... Um, Please uh, prepare your hearts for worship and your thoughts, and let us um, start with our call to worship, if you'll please stand. God called to Jonah to get up, go to Nineveh, and proclaim God's word. But Jonah refused until God called a second time. God is persistent. God believes in those whom God has called. They left their families and jobs to follow Jesus. Lord, Lord give, give us the courage to follow you all of our lives. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, From All That Dwells Below the Skies.
please join me in the opening prayer. Holy One, God of all creation, you call us to be your people, to carry your vision in this time and place, to go where you send us to help welcome your amazing good news. As we gather in the presence of the risen Christ to spread the news that your realm is near, Fill us with your Holy Spirit, O God of all creation. Fill us with your glorious spirit that we may share your good news with a world in need. Amen. And now if you'll join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Together, everybody needs you strong. But life hits you out of nowhere and barely leaves you holding on. And when you're tired of fighting, chained by your control, there's freedom and surrender. Lay it down and let it go. So when you're on your knees, an answer seems so far.
it's a stand. The reading is from the book of Jonah, chapters 1 through 4, from the message by Eugene Peterson, Running Away from God. One day, long ago, God's word came to Jonah, Amite's son. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh, preach to them. They're in a bad way, and I can't ignore it any longer. But Jonah got up and went the other direction to Tarshish, running away from God. He went down to the port of Joppa and found a ship headed for Tarshish. He paid the fare and went on board, joining those going to Tarshish as far away from God as he could get. But God sent a huge storm at sea, the waves towering. The ship was about to break into pieces. The sailors were terrified. They called out in desperation to their gods. They threw everything they were carrying overboard to lighten the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down into the hold of the ship to take a nap. He was sound asleep. The captain came to him and said, What's this? Sleeping? Get up. Pray to your God. Maybe your God will see we're in trouble and rescue us. Then the sailors said to one another, Let's get to the bottom of this. 
Let's draw straws to identify the culprit on this ship who's responsible for this disaster. So they drew straws. Jonah got the short straw. Then they grilled him. Confess, why this disaster? What is your work? Where do you come from? What country? What family? He told them, I'm a Hebrew. I worship God, the God of heaven, who made sea and land. At that, the men were frightened, really frightened, and said, What on earth have you done? As Jonah talked, the sailors realized that he was running away from God. They said to him, What are we going to do with you to get rid of this storm? By this time, the sea was wild, totally out of control. Jonah said, Throw me overboard into the sea. Then the storm will stop. It's all my fault. I'm the cause of the storm. Get rid of me, and you'll get rid of the storm. But no, the men tried rowing back to shore. They made no headway. The storm only got worse and worse, wild and raging. Then they prayed to God. Oh God, don't let us drown because of this man's life, and don't blame us for his death. You are God. Do what you think is best. They took Jonah and threw him overboard. Immediately the sea was quieted down. The sailors were impressed, no longer terrified by the sea, but in awe of God. They worshiped God, offered a sacrifice, and made vows. Then God assigned a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the fish's belly three days and nights. Then Jonah prayed to his God from the belly of the fish. He prayed, in trouble, deep trouble, I prayed to God. He answered me. From the belly of the grave, I cried, help, you heard my cry. You threw me into ocean's depths, into a watery grave, with ocean waves, ocean breakers crashing over me. I said, I've been thrown away, thrown out, out of your sight. I'll never again lay eyes on your holy temple. Ocean gripped me by the throat. The ancient abyss grabbed me and held tight. My head was all tangled in seaweed at the bottom of the sea where the mountains take root. I was as far down as a body can go, and the gates were slamming shut behind me forever. Yet you pulled me up from that grave alive, O oh God, my God. When my life was slipping away, I remembered God, and my prayer got through to you made it all the way to your holy temple. Those who worship hollow gods, god frauds, walk away from their only true love. But I'm worshiping you, God, calling out in thanksgiving, and I'll do what I promised I'd do. Salvation belongs to God. Then God spoke to the fish and it vomited up Jonah on the seashore. Maybe God will change his mind. Next, God spoke to Jonah a second time. Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. This time, Jonah started off straight for Nineveh, obeying God's orders to the letter. Nineveh was a big city, very big. It took three days to walk across it. Jonah entered the city, went one day's walk, and preached. In 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. When the message reached the king of Nineveh, he got up off his throne, 
threw down his royal robes, dressed in burlap, and sat down in the dirt. Then he issued a public proclamation throughout Nineveh, authorized by him and his leaders. Not one drop of water, not one bite of food for man, woman, or animal, including your herds and flocks. Dress them all, both people and animals, in burlap and send up a cry for help to God. Everyone must turn around, turn back from an evil life and the violent ways that stain their hands. Who knows? Maybe God will turn around and change his mind about us. Quit being angry with us and let us live. God saw what they had done, that they had turned away from their evil lives. He did change his mind about them. What he said he would do to them, he didn't do. I knew this was going to happen. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. God said, What do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broad-leafed tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. But then God sent a worm. By dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. He prayed to die. I'm better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, What right do you have to, be, uh, to get angry about this shade tree? Jonah said, Plenty of right. It's made me angry enough to die. God said, What's this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I likewise change what I feel about it, Nineveh, from anger to pleasure, this big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong to say nothing of all the innocent animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
um, betting with each other that this would be a live streaming event this morning. I said probably Ronnie won't even be there, you know, but I am so pleasantly surprised that you're here and those of you who are at home safe and not out in the storm. Uh, coming across the Bay Bridge and on Route 50 there had to be a dozen salt trucks posed and ready for action, you know, and I hope they don't have to spread that stuff on the roads which all go into the Bay and contributes to the problems we have there. When was the last time you read an entire book of the Bible? Can you think about that? You can say this morning that on Sunday morning, I read an entire book of the Old Testament. You don't have to say it was only four chapters and it was Jonah, but you can say that, right? You can boast about that. So this morning, we are going to be looking at Jonah, and I want you to answer for yourself a couple questions. Where is Nineveh today, in February of 2022? Where is Nineveh? And how much am I like Jonah? Me as an individual, and us as the church of Jesus Christ? Two important questions. The scripture we used was from um, Reverend Eugene Peterson. Reverend Peterson was my pastor for a couple years when I uh, left the Methodist church and went to the Presbyterian church when I was a young adult um, before I became a police officer. It was Christ our King Presbyterian in Bel Air. He is a great teaching pastor he first wrote the gospel and then the epistles and then the Old Testament. He has uh, since retired and, I understand, moved to Canada. Uh, Ronnie, remind me that's where the roadblock is and so forth. And so we give thanks for that. The reference I'm using this morning is from the book called The Message of Jonah by Rosemary Dixon. She does great exegetical work of the Hebrew text to bring her message and writing of that. What was really fascinating for me this morning as I was reviewing those things I highlighted in her writings is that in the very beginning of the book, she begins with a prayer from D.H. Lawrence in 1885. Let me pray this prayer with us. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God but it is a much more fearful thing to fall out of them. Did Lucifer fall through knowledge? Oh, then pity him. Pity the plunge. Save me, O oh God, from falling into ungodly knowledge of myself, as I am without God. Let me never know O oh God, let me never know what I am or should be when I have fallen out of your hands, the hands of the Most Holy Father. Save me, O oh God. Let me never know myself apart from you. Eternal Father, we come to an Old Testament story this morning of Jonah. And we want to understand this to the fullest that we can in the next few minutes. So, Father in heaven, I ask you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, let your words be our words and your thoughts be our thoughts. That either because of me or in spite of me, speak to your people who are listening this morning. I ask in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So it's been several weeks since I decided that this Sunday I would go back to the Old Testament and bring a message on Jonah. Now Jonah is an important scripture. In fact, it's so um, important that the Jewish nation is one of the readings of the minor prophets of Yom Kippur. I called Rick Bernstein and we had a long discussion about why this is one of those. So I started asking a question. What do you know about the book of Jonah? Because Rosemary in her book says, from her survey of not a few people, but thousands, we don't know the book of Jonah. 
And I got the same response she got. What do you know about the book of Jonah? And it was pretty constant. Oh, Jonah and the whale. Well, that tells us immediately you don't know the book of Jonah. And we'll get into that in a little bit. And we don't even understand who the main character is of the book of Jonah. We think it's Jonah. And we'll get into that in a minute. At the beginning of the story, the word of God comes to Jonah, telling him to go to the city of Nineveh to tell the people about God's love. God and Jonah have been on talking terms for a long time. So he gets up on a ship that's going to Tarshish, which is the opposite direction of Nineveh. The opposite direction of Nineveh. Can you imagine that? Now, let me regress just for a moment. Almost 100 years ago, a group of people came to Ferndale and said, let's build a church. Right? Am I right? What moved them to build a church on this corner? It was the word of God moving amongst them. And they went to great, great labor. I just imagine probably found the best they could find. I mean, just turn around and look at that window that's painted. That's not stained glass in the back. That's painted. That's artwork you have there. To great, great effort to praise the Most Holy Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And probably a hundred years ago, like we have, every time we've accepted members into this church, We bring them up front before the altar of God and we say, will you promise and commit? I will serve this church with my presence, my tithes, my prayers, and my gifts. That is our promise. I'm sure Jonah did something similar to that when he and God first became communicating friends. So God sends a storm, and the ship is going down, and Jonah says, throw me to the other side, and the pagan sailors sailors are wondering who this guy is, and they asked him. And through their conversation with Jonah, they are converted. Pagans begin worshiping the God of Israel, Yahweh, And Jonah, too fearful to commit suicide himself, barters with them, maybe not having the courage, you throw me over, which they did, because they thought for sure they were going to die. And Jonah thought for sure he was going to die. So let's kind of pick the story up there. And I want you to pretend like you've never heard this story before, like you're hearing it for the first time. And at this point, Jonah is sinking into the sea, but the Lord appoints a great, not a whale. I'm sorry to disappoint you. There is nothing in the Hebrew text, nothing that even suggests it was a whale. It was a large fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah stays inside that fish for three days and three nights. Doesn't that strike you as funny, right? Isn't this an unusual story with unexpected details? Well, it's supposed to be. You see, the word appointed is translated to mean commissioned. It's a governing word where a king would appoint or commission someone to go do something, an ambassador, a messenger. Would you go here and bring my message? It's something you did to a person. But in the book of Jonah, God commissions not a whale. Let's get that straight. There is no whale in this story. God commissions a large fish. And he kind of says like this. Let me put it, use Eugene Peterson's type of language. And God turns to a large fish and he says, hey, fish. And the fish says back to God, yes, God, 
And God says, go pick up Jonah. Directions will be given when needed. And this is important, fish. I want you to swallow him whole, but not hurt him. And I want you to swim around with him, but don't chew him up. And I'll tell you when to drop him off. And the fish says, okay, God, no big deal. Isn't that an odd story? I mean, doesn't that make you chuckle? So I want to pause at this point to talk to you about something that's more serious, about the nature of the story. I mean, many thoughtful people will say, I don't know if it's okay that it's in church, but I have no idea how a fish can swallow a guy. Well, let's get this straight. From everything I have read and everyone I have talked to, there is no physical way a human being can live in the stomach of a fish in the sea for three days and three nights. Rosemary, in her writings and her commentary, says, well, some Jewish people believe that it's actually a parable. It's not a true story. It's like one of the parables Jesus is used. It's a parable. It's to get you thinking about that. But she said, if you study the Hebrew text, you'll quickly see that this is no parable. This is what the Holy Scripture says, that God sent a large fish and swallowed up Jonah. And he lived in that fish for three days and three nights in the sea. So if it's not a parable, she asks the question, then what is it? It's a resurrection story, she says. It's a miracle. And people go, a miracle? Well, how can it be a miracle? Well, you have to ask yourself a question. If the God who raised Jesus from the dead could do that, could he not send a great fish and keep Jonah alive for three days and three nights? It's a miracle. It's a miracle story. The all-powerful God who raised Jesus from the dead used the same power to tell one of his creatures to go do this for me. So I don't want you to get hung up on all these details, but I want you to see the overall meaning of the book of Jonah. There is a Nivea. There is a Jonah. But there's a far more important character in this story than those two or the sailors. There is one word that is associated with this and God, and I want you to notice some writing patterns. In the story of Jonah, the word great is used often. When Jonah runs the other way, the Bible says God sends a great wind, and it produces a great storm. And the pagan sailors are converted by a great fear. The fish God appointed is what? It is a great fish. So God is doing something great in this story. Now let me ask you, as you heard the story read, and I just finished that, who is doing something great in this scripture? It's not Jonah. It's not the city of Nivea, not yet at least. It's not the sailors in the beginning. The only one associated with greatness is Yahweh, the God of Israel, the one true God. But on the other hand, listen to this. Jonah messes up everything in the main word associated in this book where God is associated with great Jonah is associated with down when God says go to Nivea Jonah goes down to the port city of Joppa I'm from Joppa if you didn't know that that's where, that's where it comes from I'm from Joppa I have my own language and everything down there then Jonah hops on a ship that's going down to Tarsus. And while in the ship, Jonah goes down in the bottom of the ship to sleep. And when he's thrown overboard, he goes down into the stormy sea. And as we all know, he soon goes down into the fish. 
He's not the star of the scripture. He's not the main character. There's only one associated with greatness. And when Jonah finds himself in the fish in the sea, Jonah hits bottom. In the midst of the Israelites, you can't get any lower than in the sea. In the sea is tragedy and calamity. It's a place of death. So Jonah, in Hebrew writings, is in the lowest of lowest places. And he prays. From the guts of a fish, he prays. Jonah prays to the Lord. He says, in my distress, I call to the Lord, and he answers me. From the depths of the grave, I call for help, and he listens to me. Jonah hits his bottom, and from the guts of the fish, from this physical condition, he emotionally cries out, In my distress, I call to you, O God. On a spiritual level, he cries out, Of the depths of the grave, I call. Now, keep in mind that Jonah has gone a long time without honestly praying to God. He has received the word from God. The Lord says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. Go there and proclaim my word. But he goes to Joppa. He didn't pray, should I go to Joppa? He didn't pray, should I get on a ship? It goes to Tartarus. He didn't pray whether or not I should jump overboard. Jonah wasn't talking to God. Jonah was off doing his own thing. He was off doing his own thing. And then he ends up in a fish barrel, doesn't he? So it is when he has nowhere else to turn, and he has nothing else to do, so what do you do in the belly of a fish? You know, eat some shrimp or something? I don't know. He has nothing thing else. What does he do? Why don't people pray? Why don't you pray? We don't pray because we have something better to do. I think the same things happen to our Christians who made a promise to God to support the church with their presence, their tithes, their gifts, and prayers. They now have something better to do. Sports have taken over Sunday morning worship. I fought with the Hereford Rec Session Center for years. And when other churches joined in the fight, we met with the county executive and the Parks and Recs Commissioner, and we agreed there would be no sports on Sunday morning in the Hereford Zone until 12 o'clock. And so we had a softball team. We put it in the bar league. Boy, some of the elders of the church said, what are, what are you doing? You're going to play in the bar league? <laughs> yep, we played in the bar league. We lost every game. Those boys can play ball. But part of the reason was we forfeited the first game because the league started at 11, and we didn't get out of church until 11. Oh, we were rushed up there to play, but if you're not there on time, you forfeit it. When he had nothing else to do, he prayed. Isn't that our case? When we have nothing else to do, when the doctors give us bad news, when we're about to lose our jobs, when there's no one to help, then we pray. The whole first chapter of the story of Jonah is about a human reaction. Jonah makes plans. Jonah has resources. Jonah is going places. Jonah's plans all turns to disaster. He doesn't ask God what I should do and how should I can, should do it. God is speaking to him, but Jonah decides, okay, God, this is what I said and agreed that we would do in the past, but, you know, I've got other things to do now, and I'll go here. And in the midst of the tragedy of his life, when he has nowhere to turn, because he's in the belly of a fish, he thinks he's going to die, he prays. So the entire chapter 2 of the book of Jonah is no action, it's just Jonah in prayer. 
It's only when Jonah hits the absolute bottom that good things start to happen to him. Is that the case for all of us? That we're too busy. Too busy. Dr. David Jeremiah says the church has left the building. He says all over, all over our country, the church has stopped being the church. We've gotten too busy. Too busy doing other stuff. So what happens next is really goofy in the story that I would not mention except it's in the Bible. Jonah gets delivered on the third day. Does any of this sound familiar to New Testament at all? The third day is a big day in the Bible when there this dramatic rescue on the part of God in the Old Testament. Jonah 2.10 says the Lord commanded the fish to do what? Do you remember what he commanded the fish to do? Well, the modern interpretation cleans it up from the Hebrew. The modern interpretation says he vomited him up. Oh, it's much more descriptive in the Hebrew text. The other night... Leslie was in the other bedroom so she can keep an ear out for her mom. Her mom gets up in the middle of the night, and her mom's going on 95 years old. So I'm left next to where the dogs sleep, and I hear that familiar sound. I'm not going to do it for you. <laughs> but you know there is a mess about to happen. <laughs> You've experienced that, huh? I have three cats. Oh, okay. Well, you know the sound then. Yeah, and before I could get there, it had happened. The parts of the tennis ball that our oldest dog had eaten was now all over the carpet. And the smell was not delightful. So I cleaned it up the best I could at 2.30 in the morning, not to wake Mom or Leslie up put the dogs outside so they could finish doing whatever they had to be do. And I thought about this sermon and the Hebrew scriptures. What a mess that was here. And what a mess Jonah must have been. Have you ever thrown up? Yeah? What is it like that's coming out? Could you imagine being covered with that? Let's, let's add some clams and oysters and <laughs> shrimp with that. Do you get the picture? That's what the Hebrew scripture says. He took a ride and he's regurgitated. But the good news, he ends up on shore. And he's not there as a tragic figure any longer, covered with suffering. He's now a heroic figure, covered with glory. He and this ridiculous covering of fish stomach essence, he is filled with joy. You see, the book of Jonah is a story of joy. A story of joy. Jonah is going down to the very end of his life, to the very bottom of his life, and God intercedes and brings him joy. Jonah ought to be the hero, but he's not. Because the hero is the Holy Father, the great Almighty God. It was when Jonah calls out to God, God hears his prayer and answers him. When the pagan sailors called out to the God of Israel, Yahweh, God hold the, heard their prayers and redeemed them. But here's what else happens. Jonah knows about Nibia. The Hebrew text and the historian says it's a vile place of moral corruption. It's an evil place of brutality. 
It's a deadly place of killing of one another. Do you know of Nineveh today? The other night on the news, the chief surgeon of shock trauma was pleading to whoever would listen, do whatever you can to put an end to this violence and crime in our state and city. And the church has left the building. Let me say this, and I think history will prove it. The weaker the church becomes, the greater Nineveh becomes. Many, many years ago, when my good friend was district superintendent of the North District, I was on buildings and locations, and we would uh, were given the task by the bishop to inspect all churches and parsonages. Let me tell you, I lived in one parsonage, and I said I would never do it again, because it was a dump. It was a dump. Shame on the church for allowing its building to become a dump. And we found over and over again churches that once had a brilliant, beautiful, clean, pristine building had allowed it to turn into something that was an embarrassment. Shame on the church that we don't keep the holy place of God beautiful and perfect. Shame on us for doing it. And all through Baltimore City right now, there are big, beautiful buildings that were built for the same reason Ferndale was put on this corner. To be the holy presence of God for the people of God in that community that are now sitting vacant. And what has happened to our city? Well, Jonah knew about Nineveh. He didn't pray about it. He just made a decision, like so many people who gave their life to Christ and committed to a church, haven't prayed about it. They just made a decision. I'm not going there. I'm not going there. And instead, he went to Joppa. He was angry with God. You know, it's really okay to be angry with God, it's okay. I mean, go argue with him all you want, because you know what? When you're arguing with God, at least you're talking to him. It's okay. Be mad with him. I say to people, it's okay. You can be mad with me. Let's talk about it. You still got to love me. If you're a Christian, you can be mad all you want, but you still got to love me. As hard as that might be. So Jonah was mad. And he said, I'm not going to do it. How would you even think about forgiving those evil people, those cruel people. How would you even think about that? But God is God. God is the God of mercy. And God, because Jonah went there and proclaimed, after all that stuff he went through, the belly of the whale and all that vomiting and all that stuff, finally goes, finally goes. And God changes his mind about a, a great, great culture of people and calls them lost children and forgives them. Who will be Jonah today? to the city of Baltimore? Who will be Jonah today for the area called Glen Burnie or Ferndale or Stevensville or Bel Air or Falston or Joppa Town or Joppa? Who will be Jonah? Who will be the message of God for the people of God to go and to proclaim the mercy of God Rosemary, in her book, The Message of Jonah, says the entire time that Jonah was hiding from God and running from God, God was whispering in his ear. 
Do you hear him? Do you hear the whisper of God? Calling you as an individual. Do you hear the whisper of God calling you as a church? Sometimes you hear through your eyes. You sit in the presence in a building that is made for God, who is God's house, with holy items commemorated and committed to God. The presence of God is all around us. Hear his whisper in the crevices of your heart and be about his work. For God spoke through a great, great Savior. And he said to us, go and make disciples in every corner of this world. Would you play our next video for us? i
video, I was looking for some video to go along with the message. And um, I had looked at YouTube numerous times, but the same that night I, I emailed you, Linda, that video had just came out the day before. It's like God gave it to us for today. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, let us not ever fall out of your hands or from your grip. Continue to whisper our names. Call to us in the crevices of our hearts. But first, Lord God, let us be silent and still so that we can hear your calling. Let us hear it with all of our senses as we look at the surroundings in which we sit, the holiness and the meaning and the effort it took to paint brilliant windows and build brilliant stained glass windows. All in honor and to glorify you. Lord, let us see with our ears and hear with our eyes that you have not left the building nor have you abandoned us nor the church. It is us who have turned from you, have found better things to do. Lord, call us, we ask. And to get our attention, not by being swallowed by a fish, I prefer, but definitely get our attention, Lord. Allow not our nation to crumble any longer, nor to continue to run away from your holiness. So, Father God, I ask you in the name of Jesus, empower us, your people, your holy church, your company of priests, to be Jonah to the community in which you have placed us. And may your mercy be upon this church and all of its members and in the community upon which we sit. Most holy God, have mercy upon us and the community of Ferndale that we will all turn away from our evilness and our sinfulness and we'll turn back to you. Father, we ask this in the most holy name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord. Amen. Let's stand together and sing as we close.
Alex, what a great closing hymn to go along with the message. Thank you so much. Poor Alex has got to do it all by himself this morning over there. It's not like it's not my job. Uh, well, I know, but still, it's still, it's good to have company, right? I was watching him, though, play a couple times, and he's not looking at the notes. He's just kind of playing and looking around. What a ter- yes. <laughs> wonderful gift. What a wonderful gift. I mean, um, when I used to talk about I wanted to play something when I was, um, the praise team at Hereford gave me a, um, what was that triangle thing? Oh, uh, I what? thought they gave you the safety belt. No, 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 oh, no, no. Triangle. They gave me the triangle. Yeah, What's the that triangle. thing called? Oh, Is it called it. a triangle? Uh-huh. Yeah. And a feather. Ah. So, so that's the skills I have. <laughs> Well, the message of Jonah is a message for everyone. You know, if we don't live by the way God has called us, and we know we're not living by the way God has called us, then we're fearful of our salvation. And when we get fearful of our salvation, when we begin to think, well, maybe I will not go to heaven, and maybe I will not be joined with the great saints of heaven, mom and dad and grandmother and all those others, then we tend to hide from God. And we think God doesn't love us. The story of Jonah, the main character is God and his great mercies. So if you've been living in Nineveh, or if you live in Nineveh, or if you have resembled Jonah and have run away from God, or you're running and hiding from God now, would you just be quiet and listen? Because God is whispering your name. He's calling you by the church, the holy church he created. I didn't create this church. I didn't call it into being. God called it into being. It's God's holy church. It's blessed by the blood of the Lamb. We are the holy presence of God in a community. And we're here for a purpose. So if you hear my voice this morning and you're battling addiction, some other sinful thing in your life, you're ashamed of something you have done, just like Nineveh, God's mercy will cover you. Just turn to God. Would you open your hearts this morning to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, God's great extravagant love gift. And when you open your heart to accept him, your sins are forgiven. And the same power that rose Jesus from the grave becomes your power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. No matter where you run, No matter where you're hiding, no matter how intoxicated you might be or ashamed you might be, no matter how noisy you are, God is whispering to you. And you can be in the depth of the ocean or even in the belly of a whale. Some people want to put him there. God is whispering. Would you let him in this morning? Now the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be yours today and every day. Amen.